and the Indian was given that right to intermarry with whites and become white. And you got a system we're going to talk about, about hopefully by the end of this thing. The system in this country is the is that people keep talking about, well, we're going to take over whites. You never take over whites. Whites got a process. Each group that comes in, they give you an option of becoming white at some point. So that way they'll always be the majority population. That's for sure. Okay. So Indians became white. That's true. Just like you've got Hispanics now coming to this country, all the Mexican, Hispanics, and Latinos. See, 99% of them is classified by, by, by immigration laws and also by their driver's license being white. <clears throat> they are not part of what you all. They got a different right. issue than you got. And you got Asians now on probation to be white. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so what we're going to do then, we're going to go back and track the Indians. That's the closest thing we can track in terms of reparations. Now, how did the Indians get over and get some of the things they're getting? Indians got slick. Even though the Indians were not quite as bright as black folk were, they were slick. They didn't get the shampoo that we got, okay? Now, what did the Indians do? First of all, nobody ever said any place in the Constitution, any place else on earth, that Indians were a nation. Nobody ever said the Indians were a nation. What was happening in the country during all the period we were talking about, about, about during, the, during the enslavement process and all the things in the 1860s, what was happening is that they were fighting Indians at the same time. All the way back when Abraham Lincoln was coming in playing this little game with black folk, they were now fighting Indians. But the difference was that you had the United States government, the federal government fighting Indians. The federal government was responsible for protecting white folk. And so therefore in the Constitution when they talked about, when they, every time they mentioned the word Indian, it was only talking about Indians because the government had to fight Indians. The Department of War had to fight Indians and protect the citizens. So Indians were stipulated for those reasons. The rest of the Indians that they, who went onto a reservation, they didn't have to pay taxes. But any reservation, any Indian who was not living on a reservation, he had to pay taxes like everybody else. So that's how they divided the Indians between those who lived on a reservation and paying taxes, those who lived off did pay taxes. But Indians always had an option. They didn't all have to live on the reservation. They could go either way, one way or the other. So they set up this situation where Indians then were, were being controlled or fought by the United States federal government. So Indians in a special category. Now here's what happened. After, after the Indians lost most of the battles in the country, the federal government was, was still dealing with them. They lost, but they lost. So they tried to put most of the Indians on reservations. And, uh, and they said to the Indians then, um, you are now basically a weak people. You've been a beaten people. And so the Indians said, well, as a beaten people, and we're on the reservation, what we're going to do, the first thing we're going to do, unlike those blacks over there, unlike those black slaves who just came out of slavery, we're not going to be like them. We're not going to be as foolish as they are. What the Indians say is what we're going to do now is that since we've lost our land, we're going to first of all lay a claim against the land. So Indians laid a claim against the land, saying that all the land in the United States originally belonged to us, we had a natural right to it. That we know we didn't have any legal documents or any deeds showing we owned it. We have a legal claim to the land. So as a legal claim to the land, therefore you took it from us, you owe us. So you could, and you, what the claim was based on what they call natural rights. Indians say there's a natural right to the land because we were the first ones here on it. Even though in fact they were not the first ones, black people before those guys got here. But I will to talk about that today. Black people have been here about, about 11 or 12,000 years before the present day so-called Asian Indians came here. Blacks have been here already. But they said that was their land. Okay? So that's what they called natural law to lay claims against the land. So that, put them, so that meant they tried to impose an indebtedness on the, on the government. Now, blacks over here who were coming free after slavery with, 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 with the shampoo on them, with, 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 uh, with uh, Lincoln, See, they try, we don't want anything. All we want is a chance to compete. We want equal opportunity. See, now Indians laid claims. All black folk wanted was an equal opportunity. Okay, then the Indians turned around and said, we want to be into a trust relationship with the United States. So they should have said called a doctrine of trust for Indians, which says, since we are a weak and powerless people, since we don't own and control anything, then since you all beat us and you've misused us and own us now, then you owe it to us to take care of us. You see, you said you owe it to us to take care of us, so they call it a doctrine of trust. So the Indians then created a doctrine of trust so the United States government would take care of them. And as a result of that, see, then they could get free land, free labor, free medical care, free education, free casinos, okay? Tax-exempt status and pay no taxes, okay? Now, here are my people over here talking about, 
we want first one, we want, all we want is equal opportunity. We don't want you to give us anything. We don't want the handouts. All we want is equal opportunity. Okay, the first thing. Secondly, where Indians, then Indians, and then they said, we are powerful, strong people. We don't need anything. Where Indians said, we are weak, take care of us. <laughs> then over here, Indians then said, we don't, but we don't want to mix with you all. We, we are a separate people. We want to stay to ourselves. What we want to do is declare ourselves a nation. We're going to declare ourselves a nation, and we're going to write our own constitution to take care of our own people. Now, go back over here to these ones that are being shampooed, see? <laughs> what they want to say is, we want to be a part of your constitution. We want to move into y'all. You see? And, and they never once have ever said that we are a nation. And so they developed some kind of a constitution or, or a national plan or empowerment for ourselves like the Indians did. That's why I wrote this new book I got come out called Power Numbers. That's what it's about. Say, for once in your life, quit being shampooed, wake up, and smell the coffee. So, uh, so I wrote that one. They say, now, like the Indians, we're going to be a separate nation. We're going to be a nation of people just like Indians are. <laughs> and the way, it's got, the, way the, way the Indians got it approved, that's after they set their constitution, they kept calling themselves a nation. And even though blacks in America are a nation within a nation, they've always been a nation within a nation. Black folk are just as segregated now as they were in 1954. You still not integrated anything. You're just as segregated now. You're still a nation within a nation. All they have to do is declare themselves a nation, get them a constitution, and that's what you're going to get in power now. Y'all make sure you buy that book when it comes out, okay? You're going to get that. Now, so now, so they got that set up. Now, what we want to do then is, so the Indians then said, they kept playing around this thing about being a nation, being a sovereign nation called themselves a foreign nation because they had to deal with the federal government because they've been because the federal government was protecting the citizens. So then by then about 18 by 1832 a Supreme Court justice named um, John Marshall he, uh, and he ruled and made it official because that time we had we had a do-gooder white liberal out messing around with the Indians on the reservation and uh, and, they, they, and I think it was in Georgia and, they, and somebody there was a law in Georgia that said, you know, they didn't want whites on the, on the reservation stirring up the Indians. So, uh, so the whites arrested him, put him in jail, something like this. He appealed and they sent him to long, like something like 15 years imprisonment. He then appealed and went to the Supreme Court. They got in the Supreme Court in 1832. Chief Justice Marshall ruled and said that, <coughs> that, that the Indians are a separate nation. He picked up that rhetoric that the Indians have been pushing about being a separate nation. And then he said, well, the Indians are a separate nation, so therefore this guy's got a right to go out there when he wanted to. And when he made that ruling in 1832, that officially then made, in our constitutional law, they started accepting Indians being a separate nation, okay? Now, now they're a separate nation, and, uh, and with sovereignty, and now they got, now watch what happens now. Now they're getting dual benefit. They're getting reparations all the time. Now, Indians now, that means every state set up an Indian, Indian uh, uh, commission. Every state has a separate Indian commission now to give Indians what they want because they're under the doctrine of, of, a, of a trust, that they are dependent people and you have to take care of them, those on the reservation. And they're never going to lose the reservation because they're not stupid. Why would they leave the reservation? They said they'd be taken care of. <laughs> and you always got people that are, look how poor they are. Yes, they're poor because they ain't going to leave there. They want you to bring it to them. <laughs> they can leave any time they want to. Any poverty the Indians got is probably sit there wait, w waiting with for you to come resolve for them. Right. They don't have to stay on the reservation. <laughs> they stay there because that's free land and free everything. So when they set up that kind of a trust, Indians then sat there and waited for it. And but see, we didn't set up that kind of trust. And when they, when they got that ruling, that made it, made it legitimate then that Indians were now an official foreign nation. And then every state then set up an Indian commission and, uh, that give, gives Indian services. Then they set up a federal Indian bureau in Washington, D.C. The federal Indian bureau typically puts out something like about twenty-three dollars to $26,000 a year for every Indian in the United States. Then you got the biggest Cher been the biggest Indian tribe in the United States, the Cherokee tribe, that picks up in terms of reparations. They pick up something like about, you got about 155,000 Cherokee Indians out there to get $170,000, $170 million a year in reparation funds. So Indians are getting all kinds of reparations. Indians have been getting reparations through treaties now, through land and free everything now for 200 and some years. Black folk have got nothing because you went the wrong way. You cannot sit there and want to be a part of white society and try to, and that's exactly what the game they want you to play. Rather than say, no, I'm a separate nation. You have problems. You owe me just like you owe the Indians. The Indians should be your model. <laughs> and that's why Indians now can walk into all the cities and now set up special casinos. You only got 237 
Indian reservation in the United States. And India's now got 258 casinos in the United States. They've run out of, they've run out of reservations to even put casinos on. And typically those casinos bring in one million dollars a day per casino. Not in revenue, not one million dollars a day in revenue, one million dollars a day in profits. So the Indians now took those, took those funds as reparation funds, and now they are building, taking that money, and they are building economic structures for their people. They are building shopping malls and centers and all kinds of things, industries for their people. While we sit here looking for handouts through affirmative action that everybody else is giving away to everybody else but us. They even make it worse than that. We sit here trying, trying to be independent and arrogant, pretend that somehow we can compete with white folks with nothing. <laughs> and, we got, and we got these little watered down, useless, half a business ain't worth two cents. And we got, we got something like about a half million black business in the United States. They only employ one and a half people on the average. <laughs> and they're always, they always bragging about, the number of black businesses have doubled in the last 20 years. Yes, the number of black businesses doubled, but the money didn't double. They ain't getting more money, you got more people chasing the same dollar. Okay, so, so first our model then should be, uh, should be ideally be Indians. We can track them and do so only will we try to, to, uh, to, to follow their policies of non-integration, but trying to be a separate people and getting them as much advantage as you possibly can. Secondly, under the doctrine of trust, make the government responsible to, to, because we are just as weak. There's no, nobody's more weak than slaves. And see, nobody, see the, the Indians were not enslaved, they were free. And yet they are now classified as weak and, and weak people, so they're given all these benefits. That's why their kids can go to school and, and get free college education. That's why they got 28 universities in the country. So we then want to get some of those same identical benefits that, that Indians are getting. So when people start telling you every time black folk want to say, we need this and that, and they say, well, Dr. Anderson, black folk are not as bad off as the Indians. I said, if the Indians are that poor, make black folk like Indians. Treat us like Indians if they're that poor. See, but they always, want to, they always want to try to neutralize any concern you have about correcting conditions of black folk by pointing to Indians. And then they point to those Indians who are sitting out here on the reservation and sitting there waiting for something. And so what I'm telling you, then let us be treated like that. Treat my people like Indians. Let us, let us be tax exempt. Well, we don't pay any taxes every year. We play the same game they're playing, okay? Now, the next thing we want to do is we've got, we got to be prepared to start answering some of these, some of these, some of these people who are going to be opposed to reparations for black folk. They're, they're going to come at you in three different ways. The first group that's going to come after you are going to be whites. You can, you can rest assured right now that 99 and 1 100 percent of all white people in America are opposed, opposed to reparations for black folk. You must be, be ready to deal with that. Be ready to deal with it. Because they're going to be opposed to you for a very simple reason. That's called R-A-C-I-S-M, racism. Racism means maintain the conditions on black folk the way they always were. So they don't want you to change anything. So they're going to come after you. But keep in mind, that whether or not white folks want reparations for black folk is immaterial. We could care less about what they think. That's not the issue. That's like, because in a system of justice, when it, it, it is not the perpetrator's responsibility to decide whether or not you're entitled to compensation. See, in other words, if you ran over my house right now and killed my dog or something, I sue you, you can't say, well, I, I, yeah, I killed your dog and tore up your house, but I'm against your suing me. That's not immaterial to me. It is black folks' uh, decision whether or not they want reparations and how they're going to get it. So, so, and they start telling about white folks oppose it, fine. I told you a few minutes ago, 99% of all the white people in America were opposed to freedom for black folk out of slavery. Keep that in mind. 99% were opposed to your being freed in 1860 at the eve of the Civil War. Also in, again, doing integration, you had about 87% of all the white people in America were opposed to integrating. So whether or not they want emancipation or not is immaterial. So be ready to deal with them. The second group you've got to deal with are going to be black folk. You're going to have all kind of black folk in this country going to be opposed to reparation for black for, for, for you. They're going to be jumping out. <laughs> they're going to be jumping out. They're going to be jumping out of the woodwork. They're going to be jumping out of the woodwork because they're scared to death. They're just as scared now as they were in 1860. They're going to say we don't have anything, and, and when, when we ask for something, they they'll take away what we got, and we don't have anything, but they'll take nothing away from us. And so and you're going to have that group that's always scared, and they're always going to say, it's better for us to have nothing than you try to get something, because that way they'll take us back to nothing with where we are already. So, so watch out for that group. 
They're going to be coming out. The other group you're going to come out against, you're going to be a lot of your black leadership in America. The black leadership is going to come out of the walls. Whites are going to pay a lot of blacks to come out against reparations for black folk. Okay? And I've already been told this by one of the biggest white law firms that I know have already said across the table for me and my staff that Dr. Anson, we're going to help you all with reparations. These are Jews now. That we'll help you all with reparations, but the problem you got to watch out for is that you're going to have all kinds of blacks coming out against you. And I said, I doubt that. And they said, no, no. They said, I said, how do you know that? They said, we might be white, but we're not stupid. <laughs> they said, we know there are blacks in America who are paid. They're paid to come out against you all on everything you want to do to get black folk out of the ditch. We know that. And you, and you should, and you, and said, if, if we're going to help you, you better be prepared to deal with that and give us some ways of dealing with it. And they're going to come after you a lot of ways. You have a lot of blacks coming after you telling you the same thing like whites, that you don't need it, or that's counterproductive, or whites can get angry, or you're going to create racial problems in the country, anything else. See, it doesn't create a problem for anybody else to get something, only when you all get something creates a problem. They're going to come out and tell you that, okay? And they're going to be paid to do it, and they're going to try to do it also by always blending it in, going back to those terms I told you about earlier. Anytime a black person comes out, start talking about all, we all, you all, poor folk, multicultural, culture diverse, minorities, you all have been had and been shampooed, okay? That's what it means. Anytime you got a black elected official, a black elected official, or a black civil rights leader, or a black minister, you're going to represent all the people, you've been had. Your first concern is you take care of your own people first, okay? You have never heard a white person jump up and say he represents all the people. Come to Washington, watch all the, all the white senators come across this country. They say, I come here to represent my constituency, my people, back in my home, in my city, in my state. Only black folk want to represent everybody. That goes back to that slavery bit I told you about earlier. Watch that. When they start talking about all and all of everyone and everybody, you're through in the country. So watch for them, and when they do it, you all nail them. Nail them up front. I don't care whether it's an elected official or a civil rights leader, okay. but they're going to be coming out against us pretty soon, okay? The second thing you have to watch out for now, we've got to be able to look for the responses that whites are going to come out with. They're going to come out with stuff like, why, should I, why am I responsible for, for, for reparations for black folk? My family didn't enslave any black folk. Fine, that's good. But you still owe us. <laughs> you owe us, first of all, because it doesn't make any difference whether or not your family enslaved black folk, you came here and enjoyed all the benefits of them enslaving black folk. And you're not paying, you're not paying for the fact that black folk were enslaved, your, whether your family enslaved or who enslaved them, you're paying for the benefits that you enjoyed then and you enjoy it now. You're just paying for benefits, okay? Amen. So you make sure you take it over to benefits. You tell me you ain't concerned about who did the enslaving, you're concerned about who's enjoying the benefits. And they're going to pay for it like any other person in the house. If you go into a restaurant, they're going to pay, whoever gets the service is the person that pays for it. You enjoyed all the benefits of coming into this country. You can't, nobody begged you to come from Europe or from the Far East or from Latin America into this country. You came here because you wanted to enjoy all those benefits that black folk had created. You sat at the table in the banquet and you ate now it's the bill time. Okay? You're gonna run it. You're gonna run. You're gonna run into some groups and be telling you stuff like, "Well, Dr. Anderson, uh, 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 I, 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 why, why do black folk deserve reparations in the first place? I mean, look, look at Jesse J uh, Jackson and look at uh, uh, Michael Jackson and look at uh, 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 Michael Jordan and look at Oprah. They got money. You gotta understand that wealth and income is totally different. Do not let anybody try to try to put down black folk by pointing to a few blacks that got income." Those few blacks that got that kind of income, I can put in one cab in L.A. and take them in place I want them. You know? We, they do not represent black folk in America. You know, I'm talking about all the poor blacks, all these blacks that don't have anything in America. You understand what I'm saying? Right now in America, a uh, 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 Hispanic or Mexican with, 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 with a, with a, with a $3,000 a year income and can live as well as a black in America with a $40,000 a year income. As a matter of fact, if I take a white person with a $40,000 income with a, between 40 and 50 and a black person between 40 and 50, what happens there, they're not equal. They might have the same income, but white folks have 3,500 times the wealth that a black person has. It is wealth in America that determines your opportunity, not income. Do not get confused with income. You see, all these so-called blacks in America, they keep talking about middle-class blacks. Blacks got into, middle, got into the middle class through income. 
Whites got into the middle class through wealth. It's a difference now. Wealth means, so that means what's left over after you pay your bills. Most of the blacks in America, I can go around right now, they got high income. I ask them for $10, they got to figure out what bill they're not going to pay next year. Because they don't have any wealth behind them. And for the sisters again, let me tell you sisters that keep getting hung up on this gender issue and let's say your blackness. If I were to take that in terms of wealth, for instance, a white woman in America who's, who heads a family, like they had talking about a female headed families, a white female is totally different from a black female. What a white female has to treat her family off of a white female headed ha household is one dollar. For that, a black woman only has three cents for every one dollar the white woman has to run a female headed household. So don't get hung up on this income business. Go for the wealth. And so we start talking about wealth. Tell white folks, and the white folks say, well, Dr. Anderson, uh, what about the fact that uh, uh, reparations were set a, 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 an ideological precedent that'll be bad for the country? That's BS. You see, let me go back again in history again. I told you earlier, go back to history. Everybody in America has gotten reparations for black folks. Now, let's go back to the earliest form of reparations. Indentured white servants got reparations. Every white person that came to America as a white indentured servant, he signed a contract for five to seven years. And at, at the end of that five to seven years, he got animals, land, it was called freedom of dues. He got freedom of dues, was an, land, animals, money, weapons, tools, and clothes. That was called freedom of dues for white indentured servants. Now, all the other whites in America, in the South particularly, got reparations after the end of the Civil War. I just talked to you, I'm gonna tell you, let me go back, I'm gonna refer back so you remember this stuff now. At the end of the Civil War, when I told you that they had all that land and all that, and all that, all that prosperity in the South, they could have distributed it to black folk. They chose instead through the Freedman Bureau to give all that land, all that resources to whites. They wanted to rebuild the South. The government, the Northern Union, put all that money into redeveloping the South and gave it to whites and back to the plantation owners. So white people all got reparations again for that. Also in Washington, D.C., uh, Lincoln passed through this bill to give every white person $300 for freeing his slave. He got reparations. Now, Indians have gotten reparations. Now, let's go to the Jews following, wor following World War II. Jews now, since World War II, have picked up over $52 billion in reparations just from Germany for what they did to them, for enslaving them. I told you earlier, when, uh, when, when Roosevelt was talking to Hitler about, what, about, the, about using free, Jew lab uh, free Jewish labor, then uh, the Jews now got compensated for that for what Hitler did to them. They, got, they picked up $52 billion just since the end of World War II. In addition to that, we went over there and bombed, bombed Japan and fought a war with Japan, and even black folks participated, helped in the fight. And as soon as the war was over, the United States turned around under the Point Four plan and gave Japan over $13 billion to rebuild. And they just finished a war with them. They went to, went to Europe and they put out another 13 to 14 billion under the Marshall Plan to rebuild Germany. The blacks default. fault. Now, with the Japanese, the Japanese came to this country, in this country, they were interment, which means in Los Angeles and around this area. They were not enslaved, they were not Jim Crow, they were not lynched and castrated. They were just simply relocated for the safety of the country. And, and, the, and the Japanese have picked up three forms of reparations already. Each, for two of them from the federal government ran one billion dollars each, giving them a one, I mean, giving them twenty thousand dollars for every adult. So they've gotten reparations. Everybody's gotten reparations for black folk. So you tell them, no, that, that, that you entitle reparations. Now another thing they'll tell you, they say, well, they'll say, well, Dr. Anderson, I'm just a single uh, uh, person trying to earn a living. Why should I pitch in and pay for black reparations? Uh, I don't have any money and, uh, and, I don't, and, and I haven't done, done anything to black folk. Get them this way. You tell them this that black folk, just like everybody else in the society, in a social democracy, have an obligation to the whole. Black folk did not take Indians' land, but we've been taking care of Indians as black folk ever since we came to this country. Isn't it okay? All that money going into those Indian treaties and going to Indians, those federal Indian bureaus, and state Indian commission, and paying for Indians so Indians can't pay taxes and giving, giving reparations to Indians. Black folk are paying for that. Black folk did not create World War I and World War II, but black folk fought and put money into it. Black folk did not steal three quarters of a trillion dollars out of the SNLs in the United States. But, but every black adult in the country has to put in $2,000 for 20 years to repay it. Black folk have not done anything in this country, but black folk are charged with everything that goes down. And so whites must understand 
that everything that went wrong with black folk, they got an obligation to correct it. Just if they're white, fine, you still pay it. There are no longer. Whites must understand that the days of the thrill are gone. Now to get the thrill, you got to get the bill. Okay. Now, as we get our money, we got to move our resources into several things. We start developing it when we get these funds. Keep in mind, no black person should be looking for money individually. We're not going to get into that bag. No black money comes except those who are going to be a part of some of our national suits. Any black that becomes a part of our national suit, you can get money directly. We'll be having hearings through the Harvest Institute in, in Washington, uh, Detroit, and Los Angeles, where we'll be taking testimony, making blacks a part of a national suit, because we're going to be going after about 257 white cooperations, okay? Now, if we win that, you get money. The rest of you blacks don't get any money that way. The way you get your money, the money's going to go into special funds in the country between two regional development banks on both sides of the country. And what we do then, black folk can go to those banks and borrow that money, either to get long-term, low-interest loans with no more than about 1% interest rate, or the money would go in to help you start a business as equity capital so you don't have any debt, okay? Two, the other thing you get, the other thing we do, we take that money and use a lot of that money to set up a special fund also to go back and recapture our black colleges and bring them back home so they can take care of their original business, okay? <laughs> Three, we're going to try to take our money to go back and rebuild our black community.